Welcome to our noontime lecture today. Uh, we so appreciate the uh, bookstore helping us uh, with this event, but we are delighted today to have with us uh, Dr. David Moffat. Dr. Moffat is reader in New Testament studies at the University of St. Andrews in Scotland, where he has taught since 2013, having previously taught New Testament at Duke Divinity School and Campbell University Divinity School. Uh, Dr. Moffat's uh, monograph, Atonement and the Logic of Resurrection in the Epistle to the Hebrews, which was published in Brill's uh, Novum Testamentum Supplements uh, series. Uh, it's one of the most important works on the book of Hebrews in the last two decades. And um, he now has a follow-up volume, Rethinking the Atonement, New Perspectives on Jesus' Death, Resurrection, and Ascension, which came out last year with Baker Academic. And we still have a few copies of that uh, in the bookstore, so you may want to rush out and grab a copy uh, after the lecture today. Um, David uh, and I have been kind of dialogue partners for a number of years. We uh, get to interact at uh, professional meetings, and he's always been just, just a, a gracious, stimulating uh, partner in dialogue, and so it's a delight to have him with us today to speak on what happened after Easter. So would you please uh, join me in welcoming Dr. David Moffat. Thank you, George. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here today. Um, apologies right from the start that I don't have a good Scottish accent. Uh, but uh, yeah, now I'm from Rochester, New York. Um, <clears throat> apologies as well, I'm jet lagged, just flew in last night, uh, but also dealing with a head cold. So if I begin speaking in tongues in the midst of this, just you know, raise your hand and you know, call me back down. But, um, right, so um, a slight revision to the title of this paper, what happens after Easter, no, happens not happened after Easter, and this, I hadn't given you this, George, so it's not your fault at all, um, but uh, also why it means that we should rethink the atonement. That's what I'll be talking about. <clears throat> For many of us, Easter is primarily a lens that helps us look back more clearly on the main event, the atoning death of Jesus on Good Friday. The resurrection is important, but its significance is often primarily viewed in terms of God's vindication of Jesus. From the vantage point of Easter, one can see plainly that God has accepted Jesus' sacrifice on the altar of the cross. Atonement happened on Good Friday, and Easter proves that it is truly finished. Even less emphasis in such accounts tends to be placed on those parts of the New Testament that highlight Jesus' ascension after his resurrection. I want to offer here some reflections that challenge this common understanding of the atonement. I will suggest that the crucifixion, while absolutely essential for salvation, is not the center of Jesus' saving work, but only one important event among others that contributes to his people's salvation, this might feel a bit like stepping through the looking glass, but um, bear with the argument and then you can push back later. I argue here that what happens after Easter, especially in the ascension and ongoing intercession of Jesus at God's right hand, is as important for atonement as Easter itself and indeed even Good Friday before it. I focus particular attention on certain often unnoticed elements of the argument in the epistle to the Hebrews, which suggests that much of our modern fixation on the event of the crucifixion is a mistake. What happens after Easter matters. To put a finer point on it, I argue here that the focal point of Jesus' sacrificial self-offering to the Father should be identified with his ascension as the great high priest into God's heavenly tabernacle, and not with his death on the cross. I begin with a bit of autobiographical context. When I began to work on the epistle to the Hebrews, I never imagined that I would end up rethinking the atonement. I set out to write a doctoral thesis that examined the question of Hebrews' relative silence on Jesus' resurrection. I knew how atonement worked. 
Jesus died as a substitute sacrifice for me. He offered himself to God when he died on the altar of the cross. Hebrews, perhaps more than any other New Testament book, provided some of the primary images and categories for viewing Jesus' death as an atoning sacrifice. I wasn't worried about those matters at all. Instead, I was puzzling over the fact that so many modern scholars from across the theological spectrum agreed that Jesus' ascension was not significant, uh, sorry, Jesus' resurrection was not significant for the epistle to the Hebrews. Some noted that the author affirmed the resurrection. Hebrews 13.20 says that God brought Jesus back again from the dead. But they argued that this was not important for the bigger concerns of the argument of Hebrews. Others suggested that insofar as Hebrews has held on to some Jewish idea of Jesus' resurrection, this notion had been redefined in terms of the ascent of Jesus' spirit directly into heaven when he died on the cross. Still others argue that Hebrews simply does not affirm any notion of Jesus' resurrection at all. The author of the epistle represents for them a more thoroughly Hellenized account of life after death that displaced any Jewish notion of resurrection. Now, to be fair, <clears throat> Hebrews does not say much explicitly about this element of early Christian confession. It seemed to me, however, that there was good evidence to suggest that the author not only relied on the confession of Jesus' resurrection, and this at critical points in his argument, but also that he assumed that the resurrection was a discrete bodily event, one that was distinct from Jesus' death and also distinct from his ascension. And so I set out to make the case that the resurrection matters for Hebrews. I found that a number of strong arguments could be made, but as the project moved forward, I came face to face with a problem that had not occurred to me before. The discreet bodily resurrection of Jesus made it impossible to view the cross as the time when and the place where Jesus offered himself to God as a sacrifice. The problem is basically this. Hebrews says that Jesus passed through the heavens as the great high priest in order to enter the heavenly tabernacle where he there appeared before God to offer himself as a sacrifice especially 924 through 26, but at other places in the text as well. But we know that this is a way in which the author is explaining the sacrificial and atoning significance of Jesus' death. The author, in other words, uses the activities of the earthly high priest on the Day of Atonement to explain something about Jesus' atoning work on the cross. For many modern interpreters, it is essentially self-evident that the depiction in Hebrews of Jesus as a high priest who enters the heavenly holy of holies and offers himself to God is a metaphor intended to explain the significance of the crucifixion. The metaphor allows Hebrews <clears throat> to say something about the inner meaning of the crucifixion or perhaps to say something about the way in which the crucifixion can be viewed as the moment of Jesus' transition from earth to heaven that explains how this singular event affects atonement. The cross and the offering of Jesus as a sacrifice to the Father are tightly bound together conceptually. We just know that Jesus died on the altar of the cross and thus gave himself as a sacrifice to God there. To separate Jesus' death and offering by inserting his bodily resurrection between the cross and his subsequent passing through the heavens to enter the heavenly tabernacle and present himself as a sacrifice to the Father would, as the German scholar Hans Windisch has argued, quote, 
destroy the unity of Jesus' high priestly work, unquote. <clears throat> Yet, Jesus' bodily resurrection from the dead, I was finding, seemed to be an essential assumption that helped explain the inner logics of many of Hebrews' most notoriously difficult arguments. There was real interpretive power in the hypothesis. It finally dawned on me that the more I pushed in the direction of showing the presence and significance of the resurrection in Hebrews, the more difficult it became to hold on to the self-evident assumption that Jesus' death was the sum total of his atoning sacrifice. <clears throat> I kept pushing to hold on to the crucifixion as Jesus' sacrifice, but Hebrews kept pushing me to see Jesus, now risen and ascended, offering his sacrifice to the Father when he entered the heavenly holy of holies. I could not make sense of those ideas in terms of sacrifice or atonement as I understood them. This kind of notion of sacrifice seemed to me, if I can cite Tom Schreiner's assessment of some of my own published work on the topic, quote, confused and nonsensical, unquote. And then the penny dropped. I had read Leviticus before, and it suddenly occurred to me that there was a lot more going on in Leviticus when a sacrifice was offered to God than simply the act of killing an animal. I sat down, and I read Leviticus straight through in one sitting, asking only one question. What does Leviticus say about the death of the animal? That changed everything because, to my great surprise, it was clear that the focal point of Levitical sacrifice was not on the act of slaughtering a sacrifice. Rather, the focus rested on the subsequent activities that occurred at the altar and, indeed, in the tabernacle itself. Certain salient details that had, of course, always been in the text emerged in a fresh way. <clears throat> it was suddenly clear, for example, as I will discuss in more detail in a moment, that no animals were ever slaughtered on the altar. It was strange to see this fact in the text, since one of the things that I just knew to be true was that altars were exactly the place where you slaughtered the animals. Additionally, Leviticus' emphasis on blood being the life of the animal was odd. Surely, blood was a symbol of death, yet Leviticus pushed for the identification of blood with life, especially 1711. The center of gravity in Leviticus was not on the death or slaughter of the animals. The center of gravity was on the acts that conveyed the elements of the sacrifices into the presence of God. And those acts occurred on the altar or in the tabernacle itself. Now this emphasis on bringing gifts into God's presence suddenly aligned surprisingly well with the very pressure that Hebrews was putting on me to see the focal point of Jesus' sacrifice not as his death, but as his ascension into God's presence in the heavenly holy of holies. Hebrews, I discovered, understood important aspects of the directional elements involved in giving a sacrifice to God better than I, as a modern Christian, did. It wasn't Hebrews who was confused and nonsensical. It was my understanding of sacrifice and of Leviticus that was confused and nonsensical. Hebrews, to put the point differently, was making me a better reader of Leviticus. And that blew my mind. But thus began for me a research project that is still ongoing an attempt to try and rethink sacrifice 
and the Atonement. And this book contains a series of uh, academic essays, which are mile markers on this journey, for whatever that's worth. At the core of this project <clears throat> is a larger conviction that our modern emphasis on the event of the crucifixion as the sum total of Jesus' sacrifice, or if one wants to include the resurrection, the so-called Christ event, is a mistake. Hebrews, in particular, focuses our attention not so much on the events that constitute Jesus' atoning work, although these are absolutely essential, but more on the person whose very story and identity are partly defined and constituted by those events. Jesus. Jesus in Hebrews is not so much the Christ who died on the cross to save us, though he clearly is that. He is rather the one who now intercedes as high priest and sacrifice for us in the presence of the Father. He is the one who saves his people, and this salvation is accomplished by his moving in very particular directions. And this directional component, which is a part of Jewish sacrifice, is where I want to focus our attention now as we think about what happened after Easter. The focal point of Jesus' sacrifice in Hebrews, I am arguing, rests on his return to the Father when he ascended into the heavenly tabernacle. So I've entitled the next section of this paper, The Direction of Levitical Sacrifice. <clears throat> Detailed examination of Levitical sacrifices shows that the act of offering a sacrifice involves a process. It's not reducible to a single event. It's a process in which the items being offered to God move in a particular direction. One gives a sacrificial gift to God by bringing it to his house and having his servants, the priests, take it to the altars and thereby convey it into God's presence. That is to say, within the context of covenant worship, where the sacred space that serves as God's house, namely his temple, has been set up and is functioning, the sacrifices offered to God naturally move from the offerers who are outside of God's house into God's house so that God could receive and, if he chooses to, accept the gift. Sacrifices ultimately move into God's presence. Roy Gain has put this well, writing, quote, in Hebrew, the idea of sacrifice is generally, is generally conveyed by the noun korvan. The meaning of korvan is associated with that of the hifil uh, verb from the same root karav, literally, to cause to come near. This can refer not only to the preliminary conveyance of offering to a ritual location, like the tabernacle or temple, but also to formal ritual presentation to the Lord. This presentation transfers something to the holy God for his utilization. So a korvan, a sacrifice or a sacrificial offering, makes something holy by giving it over to the holy dom domain of God, unquote. <clears throat> Sacrifice involves bringing a gift to God's house in order to convey that item into his presence. And this movement or direction, as well as the conveyance of a gift into God's presence, are constitutive of Jewish sacrifice. Indeed, an essential part of what makes the gift holy or sacred consists in this movement from the mundane world into the presence of God. 
A gift becomes a sacrifice by being dedicated to and then moving into God's house and so into his presence where the gift is then handed over to God. Let's then think about the fact that there is a hierarchical process involved in transferring a gift to God. As just noted, sacrifice involves conveying a gift from an offerer into God's house. This movement does not occur by way of a singular act, such as killing an animal. Killing an animal neither makes it holy, nor is this act coterminous with bringing the gift into the presence of God. Instead, by way of a series of activities, the offerer gives the gift to the priests, and the priests then take it to the altar. Actually, there's more than one altar in the temple. Um, So depending on the sacrifice, they take it to one or at least two, and then depending on how one thinks of the Ark of the Covenant, potentially three different altars. Yet the fact of the process allows the possibility that various elements that constitute the process might relate to each other in a structured and potentially hierarchical way. That only the priests are allowed to bring the gifts to the altars. And that this fact is frequently correlated with a conception of drawing near to God, entering and serving in his house or indeed at his table, implies that those activities that occur at the altars are the most significant and effectual acts in the entire process. These are the primary people by whom, the primary places where, and the primary ways whereby the gift is transferred into God's presence. The idea is most clearly illustrated on the Day of Atonement, when the high priest takes blood into the Holy of Holies, and so into the place where God's presence dwells most fully on earth. That these are the most effectual aspects of the process is particularly clear in those cases where the process achieves the benefits of purification and then subsequently forgiveness, or to put it differently, sacrificial atonement. In several cases where atoning sacrifices are described, the benefits, the atonement itself, (coughs) are most closely associated with the completion of the priestly activities at the outer altar. And see this especially right through Leviticus chapter 4. The application of blood to the altars and the burning of the choice parts of the sacrifice on the altar, on the outer altar, are the weightiest and most effective aspects of the process, at least with the sin offering. Moreover, Deuteronomy 12.27 explicitly singles out the giving of, quote, blood and flesh, unquote, (coughs) as the elements that are offered upon the altar as the sacrifice. Blood and flesh constitute the gift, at least in the case of animal sacrifice. Other sacrifices don't involve any slaughter at all but they are equally called sacrifice. And the altars are the primary places where these gifts are conveyed to God. Now the preceding points further imply that a gift is fully transferred to the Lord when a priest takes various elements of the gift to an altar or, going further, into the tabernacle or temple. By manipulating the blood and by burning part or in the case of a burnt offering, basically all of the animal, the gift is conveyed into God's presence, not least by way of of the smoke and pleasing aroma that ascends to him. The goals of the process, both in terms of giving the gift and in terms of any benefit that the act of giving might confer upon the worshipers, are attained if and only if God condescends to accept the gifts. This is right through the prophets. Doesn't matter how many gifts you bring, if God won't accept them, you're in trouble. Everything depends on God accepting the gift. The priests, 
by performing the ritual appropriately, are given a certain kind of authority, apparently, to judge that the goals, for example, atonement, have actually been attained. If sacrifice involves multiple acts, some of which are more effectual and central than others, then it seems to follow that isolating one act from the others or performing only one act from the series in abstraction from the others neither constitutes a sacrifice nor attains the benefits one anticipates from offering the gift. Thus, for example, <clears throat> if one simply killed an animal, and even if this is what happened at the temple, but did not take any of the parts or blood to the appropriate altar, no sacrifice has occurred, and no benefits accrue to the offerer because the gift has not been conveyed into God's presence. Slaughtering an animal does not make a sacrifice. Slaughtering an animal does not convey its body and blood into the presence of God. This conveyance happens after the slaughter, when a priest brings the elements to the appropriate altar. Now, by the same token, <clears throat> the gift is given wholly over to God, even when only parts of the gift are actually burned or used by a priest at an altar. When one sacrifices an animal to God, one cannot simply give some of the animal's blood to God, nor can one cut off and burn only part of the animal, say its fatty tail, returning the rest of it to the offerer or the priest to continue to own and use. Giving the gift is costly for the offerer, not least because the entire animal, <clears throat> and especially all of its blood, belong entirely to God. The blood of the animal is the element of the sacrifice identified with its life. The life of the animal must be entirely drained from the flesh and then used at the altars. Thus, none of the blood can be given to anyone other than God. This partly explains the prohibition on eating blood. In this way, all the life of any animal sacrifice is always entirely given over to God, even in those cases where some of the animal may be eaten by the priests or, in the case of peace offerings or, again, the Passover, eaten by the offerers. It's only the peace offering that offerers get to eat. Um, priests can eat others, but only the peace offering is eaten by uh, the regular layperson. Thus, when sacrifice involves an animal, slaughtering the animal and draining all its blood so that all the blood itself and all the appropriate parts can be given to God at the outer altar in particular are necessary for the process of sacrifice. It is by coming to the altar that the blood and the parts of the animal are given to God. Apart from these elements of the larger process, especially those aspects that involve the appropriate altar, the gift has not been given to God, and therefore no sacrifice has occurred. Now let's think for a moment about a point I raised earlier, and that is slaughter and the altar. A careful reading of Leviticus makes the following point clear. No animals were slaughtered on any of the tabernacle and mutatis mutandis, the temple's altars. The point is so often missed by modern interpreters that it's worth re-emphasizing. The altars at the Jewish temple, and the same goes for the biblical tabernacle, were not the place of slaughter. To speak about sacrificing or immolating an animal on an altar at the temple does not, therefore, mean that the animal was killed there. Rather, this kind of language must be understood to refer to the acts that convey the gift into God's presence. This is how it's ultimately offered to God. This fact, in keeping with my earlier observations, already suggests that the act of killing the sacrifice is lower down in the hierarchy of the process 
that was discussed above. That is to say, while the slaughter stands among the necessary, that is essential parts of the process, when the process involved an animal, so the slaughter stands among other elements that include things like selecting the right animal, preparing the animal, butchering the animal, washing its parts, salting it, etc. The act of killing the animal, like those other elements, is less weighty, less significant with respect to achieving the goals of the process than are the aspects of the process that actually occurred on the altars. There is clear biblical evidence that plainly indicates that slaughter was less important for sacrifice than offering the elements of the gift on the altar. Consider, for example, Ezekiel 44, 10 through 16. The text draws an obvious and significant distinction between the service of the Levites in general and that of the Zadokite priests in particular. Ezekiel details a telling judgment against the Levites who are unfaithful to God. Because the Levites served idols and led Israel astray, their ministry in the temple will be significantly curtailed. God will graciously allow them to continue to serve at the temple in certain ways, but they are punished by God precisely by being excluded by God from approaching his presence. That is to say, as Ezekiel 44.13 explicitly says, the Levites are not allowed to serve at the altars. That's their punishment for leading Israel into idolatry. Now, their punishment results in their service being limited to certain less significant acts that can be performed without drawing near to and entering into God's presence. That's stated explicitly in 44.11. The Levites may slaughter some of these victims. They may also perform other necessary tasks of sacrifice. Only the sons of Zadok, however, the priests, will be allowed by God to offer the fatty parts and manipulate the blood at his altars. Only the Zadokite priests are able to draw near to God and enter into his presence. The honor of serving at God's table and entering his sanctuary, see Ezekiel 44, 15 through 16, belongs only to the priests, not to the Levites. Now, the logic of God's judgment on the Levites plainly assumes the very kind of hierarchy among the elements that constitute the process of sacrifice that I just explored above. This is clear from the Levites' punishment. <clears throat> Their punishment consists in the fact that they are relegated to those roles of temple service that, while necessary, are not as significant for sacrifice as the acts that involve entering God's presence in order to serve at his table and minister before him. It is therefore noteworthy that Ezekiel states very explicitly that the Levites are allowed to slaughter some of the animals, but as part of their punishment, they are not allowed to draw near to God to offer sacrifices to him. The Levites can slaughter the gifts, but they cannot approach God's presence. They cannot serve at his altars. Here, then, is clear biblical evidence of a distinction in importance among the elements of the larger process of sacrifice. The slaughter of the animals is plainly of lesser significance than the acts that occur at the altars. The Levites' punishment which relegates them to being able to slaughter some animals while at the same time forbidding them from drawing near to God by approaching and serving at the altars makes this point especially clear. Now, there's another observation we can throw in here about the, and there are actually several other, uh, 
But uh, another one that sort of makes this point about altars and slaughter. Um, but this other observation about the location and significance of the slaughter of the gifts in relation to the altar can be made, particularly in light of the persistent idea in many modern imaginations that animals were actually killed on the altar. There is a fire on the outer altar that is perpetually to burn. And that would have made it particularly unsuited for the slaughter of animals. Leviticus 6, 12 through 13 makes it clear that this fire should be always burning. Yet the presence of a perpetual fire on the altar makes the act of slaughter there, at least in anything like, I'm sorry, this is right after lunch, but um, in anything like a decorous or orderly fashion, simply impossible. One needs little imagination to see the point. <clears throat> How would a live animal be placed on the fire and then be slaughtered? How would its blood be collected from the midst of the flames by a priest and pour uh, into in a bowl and then be manipulated at the alt altar? What would it mean to have to collect the blood in the midst of the flames and throw it around the sides <clears throat> if the animal is killed on the altar? The indecorous image of trying to kill a, li a living animal after placing it in the fire on the altar shows how simply nonsensical it is to assume that the outer altar was the place of slaughter for Jewish sacrifice. So, in sum, the biblical and second temple evidence suggests that sacrifice entailed bringing a gift to God. This consisted of a process in which gifts were transferred to God by being brought to the altars. And this process included, in the case of animals, the act of slaughter, it's part of sacrifice, but the activities at the altars were more significant. They were the means whereby the gift was conveyed into God's presence. And one additional point can also be noted. The effective center of sacrifice, as I, I suggested earlier, is entirely bound up with God's free choice to accept or reject the gifts being offered. No amount of sacrifice or proper procedure can induce God to accept the gift, a point that the prophets make. Let's then turn briefly to Hebrews. I've entitled this section of the paper, The Incarnation and Jesus' Sacrifice in Hebrews 9 through 10. <clears throat> The movement of a gift into God's house and presence, the very heart of the sacrificial process, has potential import and implications with respect to early Christian claims about Jesus' sacrifice, implications that tend to go unnoticed when the crucifixion is simply assumed to be the sum total of Jesus' sacrifice. That sacrifice involves a process that moves in a particular direction by way of a priest bringing blood and flesh to the altars. That is, the gift moves from outside God's house into God's house and presence. Already implies that a sacrifice is not reducible to any one act. Rather, sacrifice involves an entire process whereby the gift is conveyed into God's presence. The evidence suggests then that the verb to sacrifice, as we think about the meaning of that verb, should denote a process that moves in a particular direction into God's house and presence. We tend to use the verb to denote killing. That, I think, is a mistake. It denotes this whole process of giving a gift over to God. Now, these points already begin to suggest the possible significance of Jesus' ascension for early Christian reflection on his sacrifice. If early Christians understood sacrifice in terms of conveying a gift into God's house and presence, it seems prima facie plausible that the idea that Jesus ascended into God's presence might be thought to align with the offering of himself to God as a sacrifice. Indeed, this is the very directionality that we find at various points in Hebrews, but especially in Hebrews 9 and 10. Thus, in 9.7, the author stresses the fact that the high priest goes through the veil 
into the Holy of Holies once a year in order to give blood as an offering, to offer blood. Now, some occasionally argue that Hebrews does not envision blood on the Day of Atonement entering into the Holy of Holies as the offering of a sacrifice. But here in 9.7, the point could not be more clear. The high priest offers blood in the Holy of Holies. The use of the verb prospero in Greek with blood plainly denotes the act of offering. One could even say sacrificing blood to God. Jesus, as 9.24-26 through 26 explains, traverses a similar path. He moves in a similar direction in order to appear before the Father in the heavenly holy of holies, in the tabernacle in the heavens, there to present himself as a sacrifice. Now, if, as I have argued at various times and in various ways, Hebrews assumes the bodily resurrection of Jesus, if that assumption stands, and if the author knows that sacrifice moves into God's house and presence, as he plainly affirms in the direction of the travel of the atoning blood on on Yom Kippur, then when the author says in a text like 10.10 that the offering of Jesus' body once for all is what sanctifies his people, he is most likely thinking of Jesus entering God's house and presence there to present himself before the Father, to present his living blood and flesh as the ultimate sacrifice. This very direction of travel is confirmed in 10, 19 through 22, where Jesus' siblings are called to trace the same path that he has already taken and themselves to go into the heavenly holy of holies. The structural elements shared between 10, 19 through 23 and 4, 14 through 16, which as I think George Guthrie has ably proven, are clearly indicative of an inclusio, strongly imply that Jesus' act of, as 4.14 says, passing through the heavens as the great high priest is precisely the way in which he enters the heavenly holy of holies in 10, 19 through 22. And that's how he comes into God's presence. This, I think, is the point of these texts. That the author imagines this act of Jesus' heavenly self-offering to correlate with his drawing near to an an altar seems to be implied in Hebrews 13, 10, when the author says that the congregation he's addressing has an altar, from which those who serve in the tent, that is, the Levitical priests on earth, have no right to eat. This altar, the place where Jesus offers himself, would, in keeping with the direction that Jesus travels, and that is through the heavens, and the very notion of a tabernacle in the heavens itself, that Hebrews assumed, be the heavenly altar. This is the altar where Jesus goes to offer himself to the Father as a sacrifice. This location also correlates with the place where he now, as high priest, always intercedes for his people, Hebrews 7.25. So some conclusions. Hebrews has an incarnational logic at its core. The eternal Son of God is the one sent by the Father. And in 3.1, Jesus is actually called apostolos, apostle, sent one, and high priest, returning one. He is sent by the Father to become the human being Jesus, who dies to liberate his people from slavery to death and to inaugurate the new covenant. But just here, many scholars fail to note that the sun is moving in the opposite direction of a sacrifice offered to God. Only after he died and rose 
Did he then ascend back to his father's presence, a space depicted as the heavenly tabernacle? It is precisely at this point in the incarnational story that the author appeals to and applies high priestly and sacrificial ideas to Jesus. Right? When Jesus dies on earth, he's moving away from the Father conceptually. That's not limited to Hebrews, by the way. Multiple New Testament texts, even Paul in Galatians, says that the Son was sent out by the Father to die. That's the opposite direction of sacrifice. It's only when he then returns to the Father that he's moving in exactly the direction that sacrifice moves. It is not, therefore, in my humble opinion, an accident that Hebrews then focuses on priestly and tabernacle space when he thinks about the ascending Jesus. <clears throat> Just as a priest conveyed the elements of the gifts into God's presence and offered them to God at the altar, and sometimes by going into the tabernacle, so too Jesus goes into God's presence to offer himself. Moreover, just as sacrifice was a central relational element that helped maintain the old covenant relationship of God with his people, right? What's the reason for sacrifice? It's relationship. And it's there one reason to solve certain problems that occur in the relationship. It maintains the covenant. Just as that's true in the Old Covenant. So, similarly, Jesus now maintains New Covenant relationship. The very New Covenant that he inaugurated. And he maintains it by being the sacrifice he offers in God's presence. And by interceding on behalf of his people. One day, again, not unlike the high priest on earth who goes into the Holy of Holies to minister for the people and then returns to them to give them the priestly blessing, one day Jesus will also leave the heavenly Holy of Holies and return to his waiting people to bring them their salvation. Hebrews 9.28 This is the basic storyline in Hebrews, the storyline of the Son, the plot line, if you will, of the Incarnation. And I think it helps us understand who Jesus is and how he makes atonement. It is the storyline of the incarnation itself. Hebrews, if this account is right, correlates elements of that story about the Son of God becoming the ruling and ministering high priest, Jesus, the Messiah, the Christ. He correlates that with the larger process of Jewish sacrifice. That, I think, is the one of the moments of genius in the author of Hebrews' argument. It is surely not an accident of history that this very storyline would come to structure the creedal statement that defines Jesus Christ. We believe in Jesus Christ, our Lord. God's only son. This is the one in whom Christians believe. And he did not simply die to save them. He is also the one who was born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried, descended into hell, rose again on the third day, ascended into heaven, and will come from there to judge the living and the dead. All of these points, that is, the defining elements of the incarnation, the very events that give content to the name Jesus, all of these events say who this Jesus in whom we believe is. And all of these events were for us and for our salvation. What happens after Easter is as essential for that salvation as what happened before. Thank you.
<coughs> Thank you, David. We're going to uh, now have a time for uh, question and answer. And uh, Ross Hastings, who is our professor of theology, is going to come and, and start that process. Thank you, David. I've enjoyed your work uh, on the Epistle to the Hebrews. I'm grateful for it. Um, I do want to engage a little bit with uh, the essence of what you've shared today. Um, on the one hand, you helpfully challenged the fixation of some theologians with the atonement being accomplished only in the crucifixion of Jesus. This flies in the face of the tradition from Athanasius onwards. The atonement occurs in the person of Christ, incarnation onwards, and to separate the person and work of Christ in the atonement is well called the Latin heresy. Um, however, uh, the notion is especially expressed in chapter 9 of your book that begins, it is not finished, uh, can sound jarring to the centuries-old tradition that when Christ expired on the cross, his triumphant cry, it is finished, meant exactly that, that something was completed in his dying event. And there are a number of texts in Hebrews that seem to suggest that. So, for example, 2.14 um, speaks of the fact that through death he destroyed the one who had the power of death, which is a crucial part of the atonement. Indeed, the idea that the death and resurrection of Jesus signaled a completed work of atonement uh, is, it seems to me, core of the epistle. Uh, take the finality implied in the very opening text of the epistle after he had provided, after he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. And of course that phrase sat down is mentioned four times in Hebrews and it seems to me it is there a marker of the completed work of the atonement. And chapter 10 verse 12 in particular says, but when this priest had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. I wonder to myself, I, I'm very grateful for the, the approach that you have uh, brought to us, and I'm, I'm going to continue to work in my mind uh, around it, very helpful in terms of the importance of the ascension. Uh, but I wonder if, um, <coughs> if, it's, if it's not all or nothing, that there is um, certainly an aspect of the atonement that the, the basis of which is indeed accomplished on the cross, um, and that is then at the ascension uh, offered to God. Um, I mean, even on the cross, it seems to me, uh, Hebrews has this notion, that, uh, I think, quite frequently of, the, of the, the, that all is sacred space. What is Christ doing on the cross? Um, I mean, the, the whole trinity is present at the cross. I think that's an important dimension of the atonement. And so it seems to me um, unusual that we would say that there isn't um, an aspect of the completion of the atonement um, at, at that moment. Of course, uh, Hebrews 7 and 9.28 do make abundantly clear that there is a future aspect of our salvation which is dependent on the ongoing intercessory high priest of Jesus. But to me, that is salvation work, not atonement work. It may be atonement in its subjective appropriation through the high priesthood of Christ, but it is not part of objectively accomplished atonement. And this distinction reflects the fact that the old covenant priest did not just <coughs> offer sacrifices. They offered worship and prayers. Analogously, Jesus offers up our worship and prayers um, and uh, grants absolution to us on the basis of, of confession grounded in the completed work of the sacrificial atonement. So it seems to me in some that the session of Jesus signaled a completed atonement, whereas the intercession assured the ongoing salvation of the people of God. Perhaps you could clarify. Yeah, that. thanks. These are um, important and very good questions. I, I suppose um, the first thing I'd want to do is ask you exactly what you mean by this word atonement. Um, I uh, discussed this in the book, um, in the introduction in particular. Um, it seems to me that this language has created a huge amount of confusion in especially the English speaking tradition. And I debated myself whether to continue to even use it. Um, it goes back. Um, it probably predates, but at least it comes into our English-speaking tradition um, by way of Tyndale and his translation. Now, Tyndale originally translates the Greek New Testament into English um, before beginning the process of translating the Hebrew Old Testament into English, which he didn't complete. When he translated the Greek New Testament, he translated the language of katalasso and katalage, especially in Romans 5.11, 2 Corinthians 5, with this word, 
the atonement. It means basically to reconcile. And in fact, he used atonement and reconcile uh, together. Um, But then something very strange happens when he shifts to translating Hebrew into English. When he got to the verb keper in the Pentateuch, uh, which is not limited to, but it frequently shows up in sacrificial context, he translated it with this English word, atonement. Now that's curious, because not one time in Septuagint is keper ever rendered with katalaso or katalage language. Atonement, reconciliation, seems to refer, if we want to apply this language to the sacrificial system at all, to the end result of what keper helps accomplish. It does not actually translate keper. Keper is usually translated with exilaskomai language in Greek and uh, translated in the Vulgate with language of purification. It doesn't name the mechanism that allows for reconciliation subsequently to compare, to occur. Now, part of the reason I bring this up is because we throw this language around as if it, we sort of have a clear sense of what it means. But it seems to me, and um, I say this with all due humility because I'm not a systematic theologian, and I'd be quite happy for you to correct me on this point. But it seems to me that we tend to use the language of atonement in theological discourse as if it's roughly equivalent to soteriology. It becomes a kind of umbrella category under which any number of different biblical images can be slotted. So the way that I've heard this often described is something along the following lines. Um, The cross is where all the atoning work happens. But then the cross can be viewed as sort of like a gemstone with multiple facets. And each of these facets is a different particular a problem that is described in the biblical texts with its own particular solution. So you need purification, you need forgiveness, you need redemption, um, you need etc. all these different things. All of them are accomplished in the cross, um, but these are basically just different biblical metaphors to describe the singular reality of reconciliation, which happens in the death of Jesus. Now, I think that's part of this mistake that I'm trying to highlight here. That is not a sacrificial account of atonement. And in the work that I do, I try to qualify the language that I use as sacrificial atonement. Now, I moved away from that in this paper and in some extent in the book, largely because I highlight that whatever is going on in sacrificial atonement is a very specific thing. It is not the full account of salvation. Um, So when you talk about, for example, an aspect of completion, I'm not quite sure what that means. What is an aspect of completion? Is it complete or is it not complete? It's complete, okay. Now, the question of John 19.31 is, what exactly is the it? It is finished. Yes. What is it? I do not see exegetically any justification for hanging an entire doctrine of atonement on that verse. In the context of John's gospel, what seems to be complete is the defeat of the devil. And this is exactly what Hebrews 2.14 points to as well. The death of Jesus defeats the devil. This is a Passover idea. And it is absolutely central to salvation. In that sense, it's atoning. It brings about reconciliation. But you still need forgiveness and purification. And ultimately, especially in a text like Hebrews, forgiveness and purification, which are not abstract concepts. Um, Forgiveness is perhaps a bit more abstract. But purification is a very concrete physical concept. And it has to do with making mortality fit to enter the presence of God. That's what happens to the priests when they have blood placed on them in their anointing for inauguration. This is part of what blood does in the sacrificial system. It purifies things so that, God and God's, so that God's presence can be there in the tabernacle. And indeed, if the impurities build up to a certain extent, as Ezekiel itself attests, God's presence might choose to leave his dwelling place. 
and then the temple is subject to destruction. Um, but for a text like Hebrews, that purification ultimately names the perfection of human mortality, otherwise known as resurrection. And that is totally in the future for Hebrews. That is, as, that is more a part of sacrificial atonement than is a notion of reconciliation per se. Um, so, it's, uh, sorry, a bit of a lengthy answer, but um, an excellent set of questions. I'm sure I haven't scratched all the itches there, um, but I would really want to suggest that we need to be careful not to conflate bigger concepts of soteriology with sacrificial atonement. We have this based on the legacy of Tyndale, so we've got to think about that. But All right, in just a moment, we're going to uh, open it up, and there are mics on um, either side. If I could just uh, follow up. Yeah. So if you would, go ahead and make your way um, to be prepared to uh, ask questions <coughs> there. Uh, let me just follow up just for clarification. So in your, in your book, uh, the new book, The Rethinking Atonement, um, you do talk about this kind of package deal, we could, could say, uh, in terms of the sacrifice. So you say the author knows that Jesus is the one who died as a sacrifice, rose as the sacrifice, and ascended into the heavenly tabernacle to offer himself to God as a sacrifice. If the author could work with this sort of sequential understanding of the process of sacrifice, then one can plausibly see how he could have referred to Jesus' death as an element of his sacrificial offering without assuming or intending to imply um, that this aspect of the sacrificial process was the sum total of the offering. Right. Yeah. So I think, that, I think you've made the case uh, very well, and you know, I agree <laughs> with you on that. I've taught that for years, that you have Jesus going into the yeah. Holy of Holies as the consummation, I actually use the language of inaugurated soteriology on the cross, that you have something inaugurated that mm. is then consummated yep. uh, in the heavenly holy of holies. Yep. But you, you spent a good bit of time um, speaking about uh, death in the Levitical system as not being the, the thing. Right. So what is, what is the connection as you move to Hebrews? What's the role of death? Yeah. Part of what the author is doing is reading the Christ event, right? Yeah. Uh, and reading Leviticus in light of the Christ event. So if you could clarify that a little bit, because it sounded like two different things there. Yeah, thanks. Um, it's also a great question. Um, so, I mean, if we come back to, like, this image of the cross as a jewel with these different facets, um, I think the image is capturing something that is true. And what is true about it is that Jesus solves all the problems that keep God and humanity apart. Well, in that sense, that is full reconciliation, Okay. But what I think is a mistake here is viewing it in a reductive fashion as if the, the facets all point to the cross. If we could take that jewel and open it up and spread it out and see the facets, we would see that while Jesus solves all the problems that keep God and humanity apart, he does not solve all the problems at the same time and in the same way. And this is where thinking about sacrifice as a process already allows us to see that there's even more going on there than just one single thing that solves all the problems. Um, now, how do we look at a text like Hebrews and the death of Jesus from that perspective? I think there are a couple of different things that can be said. One, to talk about a sacrificial death is not the same thing as saying that death is sacrifice. Is that clear? To say that a death is part of a sacrifice is not the same thing as saying that death is the sacrifice. It's part of the process. That is one way in which I think we can look at the death of Jesus as sacrificial in Hebrews. But the death is not within the sacrificial system of Leviticus, within the Old Testament. The death is not the mechanism that brings about the atoning benefit. That's all about bringing the sacrifice into God's presence, and it all hangs on God accepting it. Sorry, just as a side note, if Jesus imagined that on the cross he's offering himself to God as a sacrifice, then the cry of dereliction has got to mean that he concluded God didn't accept his sacrifice. <laughs> God has forsaken him. That's not acceptance. Okay, but that's just a separate little point. 
Um, when it comes to thinking about the death of Jesus in Hebrews, Hebrews, I think, makes a distinction that we tend not to make. And that is, he can distinguish between certain things that, by tradition, he knows are associated with Passover and certain things that he knows are associated with the Day of Atonement. These are two different kinds of sacrificial rituals. Passover is a very liminal sacrifice. It doesn't quite fit the categories of Leviticus. Uh, but it is primarily associated, in Jeremiah 31, with two key events, Exodus and covenant inauguration. That's exactly what Hebrews is doing in 2.14. It is Exodus. You are freed, liberated from the one who held you in slavery, the devil. The defeat of the devil is closely correlated with the death of Jesus. And that is across the New Testament. And it's across the New Testament not least because it's a Passover idea. But when it comes to actually then offering a sacrifice that makes atonement in that kaper sacrificial sense, not in the big sense of reconciliation. Well, that's where he goes to Yom Kippur. And for the author of Hebrews then, he can make some distinctions between Passover and Jesus ascending into the heavenly tabernacle to be the Yom Kippur sacrifice, which allow him then to not confuse or conflate what the death of Jesus does inaugurates the covenant and releases the people from slavery, which then allows them to enter a kind of new exodus, new wilderness state, right? Right after he talks about defeating the devil, where do the people end up? Where's the congregation? In the wilderness, Hebrews 3 and 4. He's working with a narrative here. It's a Passover exodus in the wilderness narrative. Um, and then he can focus on the sacrificial ideas uh, of atonement by thinking about the ascension. I don't know if that's helpful or... Yeah. And okay. by the way, I wouldn't also want to say, I'm not saying that even plums all the depths right. of how you can think about the death of Jesus in Hebrews, let alone the New Testament. Right. In Hebrews is not the whole New Testament. So there's a lot of other things that have to be right. thought about in terms of bigger theological reflection. Okay, thank you. Yes, here. And then we'll, we'll kind of go back and forth, yeah. <clears throat> Thanks very much for your talk and for highlighting uh, an important topic. I was a bit puzzled um, in, in, for the reasons I'll explain. You, you present this model of Jesus' uh, sacrifice as a process that's completed when he enters the heavens, and that is consistent with the coming of the Holy Spirit <coughs> after Jesus' ascension. So yeah. God does something. Yeah. And so, okay, the sacrifice being accepted, I'll send the Holy Spirit. What, what I don't see fitting into the model, and perhaps you can explain, is where Jesus dies on the cross and the temple is torn in two, which is also God doing something because he tore the, 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 the uh, curtain in the temple in two. So how does that fit into your process? Because it seems to me to imply that something had been done earlier that, was satisfa that, that satisfied God. Um, well, a couple of things that just have to be said. Um, first of all, Hebrews doesn't appear to know this rending of the temple veil tradition. So we have to think about what sort of question we're asking. Are we asking sort of bigger canonical theological questions, or are we asking a question about Hebrews per se? Okay. Now, what I'm hearing is a bigger canonical question. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, so it seems to me that the rending of the veil is probably an, uh, a notification of judgment on the temple. I think it actually corresponds with the cleansing, so-called cleansing of the temple event, that in the death of Jesus, the temple is going to be judged. Um, this correlates really well with the notion of innocent blood being spilled, um, which you get a direct connection in, say, the Gospel of Matthew um, between the uh, spilling of innocent blood and God bringing judgment on Jerusalem and the temple. So I think that's what's going on there. I don't think that it's correct to read the rending of the veil in terms of some kind of new access because Jesus' spirit is kind of going through into the heavenly space now. Although, I mean, people do interpret it that way, but uh, that's how I would respond to that. As far as the point about the Holy Spirit, this is bang on right. And um, if you have a minute, take a look at Acts 5.31. In Acts 5.31, 
um, Peter and John, who have been hauled before the Sanhedrin, I think it's Peter speaking, says that this Jesus whom you crucified, God has raised up and made both Lord and Archegos, which is interesting for those of us who study Hebrews. It's the only other place the word shows up in the New Testament is Hebrews, but, you know, maybe sort of pioneer. Um, he raised him up and exalted him to his right hand, and then comes an infinitive, which suggests the purpose of the exaltation. It's from didomi, it's dunai. He exalted him to his right hand in order to give forgiveness, repentance and forgiveness of sins to Israel. Now that is a remarkable verse, because it suggests exactly what you pointed to, that the mechanism of repentance and forgiveness in Acts is associated with the exaltation to the right hand. And it's precisely after that repentance and forgiveness have been given, I would suggest, that then people become fit receptacles to receive the Holy Spirit. If all the atoning work of Jesus is done on the cross, why isn't the Spirit, bang, poured out the minute Jesus expires? And yet, we have two different traditions. They have a different timeline, but they have the same basic logic. Gospel of John and Book of Acts, which say that Jesus first has to ascend before the Spirit can come. And Acts 5.31, at least in the Acts um, question, I have an article, on, a chapter on this in the book, um, gives us, I think, the logic, and it's precisely that in the ascension, Jesus makes that forgiveness and purification possible so that the Spirit can be poured out. The model for that is something like Exodus 40, where first you have to purify the tabernacle with blood and oil, at least in the Second Temple traditions, and then the glory of God is able to dwell there. Okay, thank you. Uh, over here to Simon. Thank you, Dr. Moffat. It was yeah. a very good lecture and a lot to, to think about. Um, you may have started to kind of answer this uh, as you made the distinction between the, the Passover and uh, Yom Kippur, but I'll ask my, my question anyway. Um, if, you know, if someone, if an early Jew would have understood that uh, sacrifice <coughs> wasn't complete until, until the point of offering, um, and in the case of Jesus, this would have been his ascension, um, and um, yeah, and so there were many parts of the process, a key fundamental part was the ascension. Then why does it seem like, you know, Matthew and Mark, you don't have the ascension narrated. John, I think maybe kind of mentions the ascension throughout the gospel, but doesn't actually narrate it at the very end, maybe. Um, then, but they still seem to view the, the sacrificial work of Jesus as complete in some sense within their gospel. And so, um, you know, Matthew 26, you get Jesus' sacrifice compared with the, the Passover um, as the, he institutes the Lord's Supper. Um, my blood of the covenant poured out uh, for the sins of the world or poured out for the forgiveness of the world. Um, yeah, so w what would be your answer to that? Like, if, if it's such a, f if ascension is so fundamental to the, the, the sacrificial work of Jesus, why um, do you not get in Matthew and Mark and differently in John? Yeah, um, I think we'd have to think about the purposes for which they're writing and the issues that they're focused on. Um, I would suggest that they focus primarily on Passover. And Passover, the blood of the covenant poured out, Exodus 24. This is the same kind of combination that Jeremiah 31 already anticipates. Uh, I made a covenant with you the day I took you by the hand and led you out of Egypt. Exodus 12 and Exodus 24 seem conceptually to be closely linked in some Jewish interpretation, not least because Jeremiah points in that direction. Um, what happens subsequently then is, of course, the whole living within this covenant community. I am with you uh, because all authority on heaven and earth has been given to me, at the end of Matthew. It's what happens next then, which in some ways I think ends up for early Christians structuring the canon. As for why the ascension is not mentioned more frequently, I think actually we need to take seriously, and you have to, you have to be careful with this, but you know, if I say, like, isn't it great that we can all meet together in person? If you looked at me and said, what on earth are you talking about? Why is this such a big deal that we're meeting in person? I would think, well, what rock have you been living under for the past four years? Everyone in this room will know instantly 
that I was referring to the pandemic. It is so essential an assumption that we don't even have to name it. Now, being able to demonstrate when those uh, assumptions are in play is, of course, the real key to making those kinds of arguments. But um, I would suggest that actually the ascension is far more uh, um, present as an implicit assumption. Even take something like uh, 1 Corinthians 11 when Paul talks about uh, we proclaim in, in the Eucharist, we proclaim his death, absolutely, until he comes. Is that ascension or not? Where is Jesus? How can he come back? It's an implicit assumption. He doesn't name it, but that's exactly the logic that's there, in my humble opinion. So, okay. yeah. Thank you. Over here, Jim. Yeah, thank you very much for this. Um, and this kind of gets back to uh, an issue that George had, had raised earlier. Um, Hebrews 1 is obviously comfortable with reinterpreting certain Old Testament passages in the light of Christ and intentionality that at least uh, temporally speaking wouldn't have occurred to the writers of the passage. I don't think I'm saying anything controversial by saying that. Um, so if, if we do think in Christological terms about this kind of motion of atonement that you're sort of insisting on, one of the key differences it seems to me is in the Levitical system, when the priests are approaching the altar to offer the gifts, that animal is dead. Yeah. It's, it's not coming back. That's right. Right. When Christ is moving towards God the Father, he's alive. That's right. And glory to God for that, right? So it seems to me the reason that he's alive is precisely because the, complete, the, com the completing work of his death confers those divinizing benefits on his flesh that he can then offer to the Father and offer to us. So I'm just curious where you would take that. Uh, I think I would say yes to that. I mean, the resurrection is where the humanity of the eternal divine son is itself participating now fully in a revealed way in that eternal divinity. Um, and, you know, to say that it is finished or to say that the death accomplished certain things, I absolutely think that's true. I totally agree. What I don't think is true is to say that it is finished means all of atonement or the death of Jesus accomplished everything that equals atonement. That's what I think is a mistake. And um, I'm not happy just saying that what happens in the ascension is sort of an afterthought to what happened in the crucifixion. Yeah, yeah, I totally understand that. I guess what I'm saying is <coughs> if you know, suspending all suspicion and disbelief, mm. if we are willing to reread that yep. Levitical movement from yep. the moment of death, or excuse me, the moment of from life to death yeah. in light of Christ who reverses that, yeah, yeah. that movement, yeah. that seems like it might at the very least raise some questions about this kind of de-escalation of the importance of death in okay. the new sacrificial system <laughs> that we, that's been conferred on us. Okay. I would be perfectly happy in principle to think in those ways. I am not in principle assuming that Leviticus by itself determines how we read Hebrews. Um, however, having said that, and based on the autobiographical comments I made earlier, what really stunned me was that something that looked nonsensical to me actually fit remarkably well by analogy. It's not 100% but remarkably well with certain key points of Leviticus that it seemed to me Hebrews is tapping into. And here I would want to argue, if we're trying to think historically, which doesn't necessarily equal thinking theologically, I don't want to separate them completely, but I do want to allow that there are ways of doing theological reflection which are not going to be limited historically in the ways that I'm about to suggest. But if we're thinking historically, then I think we have to presuppose that early Christians did not have fully formed a Christology and a soteriology that just kind of landed on them. Jesus died and bang. Uh, they had to think this through. And as they thought it through, they used their scripture precisely under the conviction that the same God who spoke these words in their scripture in the past is the one who raised Jesus from the dead, which means 
that there were real opportunities for them to do constructive Christological and soteriological reflection on the basis of their scriptures, on the basis of the Old Testament. That means that there's real dialogue going on. And what I, this is a bit of painting with a broad brush, but what I think tends to happen is that we end up with a kind of one-way street in which our preformed Christology and soteriology become critical tools that we use to then read the Old Testament. Whatever we might do with that in subsequent theological reflection, the earliest Christians I don't think were working in that monodirectional way. I think they were constructing their Christology, constructing their soteriology with things they confessed about Jesus, not least his ascension, and then reading their text and discovering that their text actually uh, spoke into um, who they understood Jesus to be and what they understood their salvation to be. Okay. Is, that, is that helpful? Or? Yeah. yeah. Okay. It's a long, Thank you very much. Conversation, uh, yeah. 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 Thank you very much, David. Thank you for <coughs> your uh, responses. And um, it's been a stimulating conversation today and uh, hope that you guys have enjoyed it for those of you who are watching online thank you for being with us as well so let's all join in uh, thanking Dr. Moffitt for being with us yeah. thank you it's been a pleasure again run out and buy the rest of those books and um, we'll look forward to seeing you at our next public lecture <laughs>